one of the most amazing things I've ever experienced is actually being present at the moment when someone received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There's really nothing almost more extraordinary than that. Have you experienced that? Let me see a show of hands. If you had a chance to be present when someone received Christ, when someone got saved, put your hand up. Now, if you're saved, you get to include yourself. Because I do hope that you were present when you accepted the free gift of salvation. It was real good to be present and accounted for at that moment. So there's actually more hands to be held up than you might think. But there's another amazing spiritual wonder. It's the only way I know can think of to say it. Spiritual wonder that I love to see. And that is the transformation that people go through as they become more like Jesus through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Now, the moment of conversion, if you will, the moment of acceptance of Christ as Master and Savior is a singular moment. But this business that I'm talking about now, the gradual transformation of a believer as he or she becomes more like Jesus, that's a journey. And that's a journey that we're all on. It's a journey that we're on every single day. And every day includes every day. Every day. day. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is in the Spirit and is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. That's what I want to talk about today. As she told you earlier, as Cindy told you a little while ago today, we are talking about discipleship, and the title is, Now What? I don't know about you, my favorite part of the year is mostly the second half of the year, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Well, first of all, there's my birthday in late June. I like that because only people that are still on this side of the grass have birthdays. Then there's the July 4th weekend, and there's food. Then before you know it, it's Labor Day weekend, and and there's more food. (laughs) Then before you know it, it's Halloween, and we're doing trunk or treat, and we are surrounded by things that are sweet, that really probably shouldn't be called food, but by golly, we're going to eat it anyway. Amen? Anybody guess what's next? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, That's right. More food. Had two Thanksgivings this year. We had an early Thanksgiving because my, my nephew was in town, and so we got to have Thanksgiving with him. And then we had yet another Thanksgiving on, get this, Thanksgiving Day. Imagine that. So if I went anywhere hungry, it was my own fault. And then, of course, as soon as we get past Thanksgiving, before you know it, it's it's Christmas. And for some reason, there seems to be food involved with that as well. What is not to like, right? What is not to like? Then, of course, now we're right on the very ragged edge of New Year's. And there will be at least snack food. There will be be crunchy, salty things to eat. And I don't know about you, but I like crunchy, salty things. Yep. So there's a lot of things to like about that. There's, there's a whole journey there involving food. Food for our stomach. What about spiritual food? How are we doing on making sure that we are feeding others spiritually and getting fed spiritually? And that's what I want to talk about. When I say, now what? I want to talk about discipleship. Let's talk about this journey that I said that we were on. We had the, we had the, the, the singular moment of conversion, the singular moment of salvation. Now I want to talk about the journey 
which the, the churchy word that is used most often for it is sanctification. Now, everybody knows what sanctification is, right? Of course not everybody knows what sanctification is because it's a churchy word. Sanctification is becoming day by day more and more conformed to Jesus. In, in this, this, the simplest definition is being set aside for a special purpose. Something that is sanctified is like your fine china that you've got in the hutch. It's, it's being saved for a special occasion, okay? But for the believer, that doesn't mean that the, that the special occasion is only Thanksgiving when you get the china out. It doesn't mean that it's only a Christmas dinner when you get the china out. It doesn't mean it's 4th of July when you get the paper plates in red, white, and blue out. No, really sanctification is a, is a daily journey. And it continues until we are face to face with Jesus, right? We need to be spurred on that journey by being discipled by someone. And we need to gain traction in that journey by discipling others. This question got asked earlier, but I was around the corner, so I didn't get to see it. Who's got kids? Who, keep your hands up. Who has kids that maybe are adults now? Now, if, you're, if you have kids that are not adults, keep your hand up. And if you've got kids that are adults, add your hand. If you raised somebody else's kids, I'm not making this up, and I know this one because I've done it. Yep. Look at all the hands. Look at all the hands. Look at all the hands. You're disciplers. You are pouring into lives at the most important time in life to pour into them. The younger, the better. The minds, the minds of youth are, are plastic. And by that, I mean they're very flexible. And they're, they're eager to consider and evaluate new and radical ideas. Not like us old coots that get set in our ways, right? We need, we need more exposure to younger humans so that we can keep our minds young. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's talk about this discipling word that gets thrown around a lot. Like I said, it means basically making a deliberate effort to help one another grow in our conformity to Jesus, to be more like Jesus. Discipling is deliberate because it seeks to help specific individuals grow in specific ways toward godliness. And discipling is mutual because it's not a one-way street with a robe-wearing sage in one corner and a rag-wearing student in the other corner. Every Christian, and every Christian includes every, every Christian, needs spiritual formation. And every Christian is equipped by the Spirit to build one another up. Every Christian is equipped by God's Holy Spirit to build one another up. Let's look at Jude chapter 1, verse 20. It says, But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of Holy Spirit. And let's go to Ephesians 12 next. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Now, somebody who's well-informed in what the Bible says, hey, you skipped Ephesians 11. It's not on the screen, don't worry. But I'll, I'll read Ephesians 11, I'll add it. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. You say, well, you left that out. And all of that, I'm not any of those things, so it means it's, that ain't my job. So sorry, Charlie. That's not going to go. The gifts, the apostles. Who are apostles? We are church planters. That is the traditional term that is used for an apostle, a church planter. But when someone accepts Christ and someone begins to grow in Christ, where has Jesus moved into? 
He's moved in here. A church is being planted here. So, in a manner of speaking, each one of us in the midst of discipleship can be an apostle. Then there's prophets. And we know that the Old Testament says you don't want to be, you don't want to be too enthusiastic about being a prophet because if your prophecies don't come true, you get, you get stoned to death. So we don't want that. <coughs> Excuse me. However, when it comes to prophets, what's the best way to understand God's prophecy? Read His Word. If you want to have an idea about how history is going to unfold, you can read all the way to the end of the book and find out. We, 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 do, we do win at the end. So prophecy is many things. One of the things it is is understanding God's Word and sticking with God's Word. Evangelists. We're going to talk about evangelists more in just a moment. And pastors and teachers. Well, I'm not a pastor. What is the four tasks of a pastor? Does anybody know them? Guide, provide, correct, protect. Remember all those hands that were up with kids? Remember all those hands that were up there with adult children? Remember all those hands that were up with the children of somebody else's that you helped raise? Did you guide those kids? Did you? Did you provide for them? I guarantee you, especially if they were younger, did you correct them? Did you protect them? Guess what? Pastor, if you want to say it with a lowercase p on the front end, but that is the pastoral role, and you've all done those things. You've all done those things. So sorry, you're included still. And last but not least, teachers. Have you ever taught anybody anything? Yeah. See? So you're not off the hook. It's not my job. It's not Pastor Steve's job. It's not Pastor Michael's job. It's our job. Each and every one of us. 1 Peter 2.5 says this, And you are living stones that God is building into His spiritual temple. What's more, you are His holy priests. Through the mediation of of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. So, discipling one another should be normal. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the why, the who, and the how. Okay? Let's start with the why. <coughs> the why. I'm going to pick three reasons why we should disciple one another. And I'll elaborate a little bit more on one of them. Reason number one, we should disciple one another simply because Jesus commands it. It doesn't get much simpler than that. He gave the church that command in Matthew 28. Let's read Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That answer right there, Jesus commands it. <laughs> that should alone should be sufficient. We're talking about our Master and our Savior. It is not a suggestion. It's a command. It's an instruction. Reason number two, we should disciple one another because we care about personal holiness. Not just our own, but the person that we might be discipling. Not just our own, but the person that might be discipling us. Because it's a two-way street. We can both be discipling somebody <coughs> And we can be discipled by somebody simultaneously. In fact, I believe that both should be present in our lives. Both of them should be present. 
people, people struggle with the whole thing. Well, I'm a Christian now, so that means I'm not going to sin anymore. I can't make any more mistakes. I've got to do everything right. I've got to check all the boxes. There's a whole bunch of neurotic stuff that can start to crop up in our minds when we consider our salvation. And one of the reasons for that is because when we receive Jesus as our Savior, we are a new person. God's Word tells us this. We are a new person that still possesses old habits. I'm a big believer in when it comes to modifying my own behavior. I need to look at those behaviors which are not healthy. I need to look at those behavior, behaviors that do not please God. I need to look for those behaviors that, as someone I know says, doesn't make Jesus smile. And I need to replace them with different behaviors that do please God, behaviors that do conform to His Word, um, behaviors that will cause Jesus to smile. The issue is not the fact that I have old habits still. The issue is, am I doing something about it? Discipleship plays a powerful role in this. Discipling is another <coughs> effective means to that end of becoming more like Jesus, being that new person, and replacing old behaviors with new behaviors. Trust me, you'll have time to do it because in order to engage in all those new behaviors, you have to put down the old ones. We have to sacrifice something we like for something that's even better. Reason three, we should disciple one another because we care about our witness to the world. Our discipling is actually connected to the global advance of the gospel. If we are working on discipling others, and you've only got to be one step ahead of somebody to help them move forward in their walk with Jesus, right? If you're only one step ahead, you're working those spiritual muscles. You're thinking to yourself, if I'm going to disciple this person, I can't do this off the cuff. I might want to prepare a little bit because this is too important to jack around with. I might have to do something revolutionary. I don't know, like, I don't know what. Read the Bible? What that now? That's just crazy talk. You're getting pushy now. You've gone past preaching and straight into meddling, right? We need to be, we need to be immersed in His Word every day. And every day includes... Every day. If we care about our witness to the world, how are we going to witness something that we know nothing about? How am I going to be an effective witness if I just remain a new person with old habits? There are followers of Jesus that have walked with him their entire life. Some of you in this room, perhaps for many decades. There are other followers who have known Jesus for many decades, but only have one year of spiritual maturity that they've repeated over and over and over and over and over again. That does not cause Jesus to smile, in case you're wondering. We read Matthew 28, 19, and 20 a moment ago. Let's go to Matthew 28, 18 now. Jesus came and told his disciples, quote, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. There's nothing subtle about that. There's nothing that, there's, there's no modifier in there that says, except in this matter or except in that situation. I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. All authority is given to Jesus so that every nation can hear the good news of the gospel and submit to the king. And that's what we want. We want the nations, and nations are made up of people, and people are a whole bunch of individuals, most of them new people still with old habits. And we want them to submit to Jesus through faith in him. So we have that, that has to be our witness. Am I living my faith every day? 
am I comfortable with, if the topic comes up, sharing what I believe and why, in a way that is gentle and respectful? That's 1 Peter 3.15. If somebody asks you, let them know the reason for the hope you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. Because our motivation is not to win an argument. Our motivation is love. Our motivation is to plant a seed. That's when we're engaged in evangelism. And if it's a fellow believer, it may well open the door into a discipleship relationship. What's Jesus' game plan for this? We go back to Matthew 28. He did not say, go therefore and make converts. That's a one-time event like we talked about. It's go therefore and make disciples, and that is a lifelong journey. Because that's how long it takes to teach converts how to observe all that the Lord has commanded His people. The spread of the gospel throughout the world will happen as we obey this call to make disciples. The process of discipleship is how the word gets out and sticks. Let's, let's talk about the who next. In theory, any professing believer is a candidate for discipling. However, we cannot disciple unbelievers, all right? Because they do not have Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. But people who aren't spiritual or if this was North Carolina, I spiritual, can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. These are not people that we disciple. These are the people we evangelize. There's a distinction. Remember, if they are unsaved, if they don't believe that Jesus is Lord and Master, they're not ready for discipleship yet. They need something else first. They need to make a decision regarding who He is. If they make the right decision, then the discipleship journey can begin. But when it comes to... Uh, when I said any professing believer is a candidate for discipling, I said... In theory, while any professing believer is in fact a candidate, here's the thing. We are all limited creatures. <laughs> I can't speak for anybody else here, but I can only be one place at a time. And I'm willing to bet it's probably the same for you as well. So we cannot be expected to disciple the entire world or even your entire church. Imagine any one of you deciding, I'm going to set a meeting with everybody that's here in service today, and we're going to get together for an hour, each of us next week, and we're going to engage in discipleship. That probably wouldn't work. It's not practical. It's not realistic. But when we talk about the church, that's where discipling gets particular. You and your fellow congregants, your fellow church partners your fellow believers here, all of us, we have decided to agree to the same doctrine. We have decided that we're submitting to the same process of spiritual formation of which messages like today is part of that. And we've committed to love and walk with the same people. We've made a decision, whether we get along easily with everybody or we discover that in a church that we love, that we may run into somebody for, who is spiritual sandpaper for us, we have decided that this is where God has called us to be. And because this is earth, not heaven, it will not be perfect. So this is a great environment for discipleship. Well, you said I can't disciple all these people. I did. Bear with me. We're getting there. The membership, speaking in, speaking in terms of the people that call Thrive Church home, the ecclesia, the called out ones, that's the second most important book 
after the Bible. The Bible tells us how to disciple one another, but the people that we attend church with remind us that we should deliberately disciple. The members here at Thrive, the partners here at Thrive, the attenders here at Thrive should be the primary recipients of our discipling efforts. And we should be the primary recipients of their discipling efforts. When every member is seeking to grow in grace together, we live out the reality of what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. We will speak the truth in love. What Paul's talking about here is our motivation is to show the love of Jesus, not to win a discussion or an argument. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. He makes it fit together perfectly. That's not something we can pull off. That's something he does. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Try to imagine what it was like going back to when we were babies. Now imagine that your head grew and nothing else did. <laughs> Go back to when you were babies. Imagine everything else grew except your hands and your arms. <laughs> you could do that bit from this animated movie from years ago. Why haven't you seized the boy? Because I have a big head and little arms. <laughs> T-Rex. T-Rex, that's right. Somebody had seen that movie too. Sick, sick movie. I cracked up. I didn't hear, I didn't hear any dialogue from that movie for the next five minutes after that. I was just, I was a goner. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Jesus, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't disciple people that happen to go to another church. I am simply saying that the best and most natural discipling relationships will happen right inside your home church. There's no better place. And I have to say something here. You say, well, I don't know about, you know, this discipling thing. I need some, I need some training in that. I need, I need somebody to show me how this is done if I'm going to disciple anyone. Well, you know what? We have an environment exactly for that. It's called Thrive Groups. These are our small groups. They meet during the week. They work a lesson together, and they do life together. I've had the privilege of being a small group leader for 17 years now. It is one of the highlights of my life. One of the people I have to blame for it is sitting right there. <laughs> Pastor Steve, it was Pastor Jay too, but Pastor Steve was relentless when it came to, so when are you going to go ahead and sign up for group leader training? <laughs> and when it started, my wife and I would walk out of church and we'd laugh and laugh and laugh. And you know what? He would not quit. He did not stop. I could tell a lot of stories. I'm not going to get them to all right now because tick-tock, tick-tock. But I'll tell you the stories later if you're curious about what happened on that journey between laughing about it and stepping out in faith and stepping into it. I'll be happy to share the story with you. It will be a discipling moment, and I'm all about that. <coughs> got, it? got it? So if you got questions, ask, you. ask me in tween. All right. Let's move on, though, right now, and let's talk about the how. The how. And this is continuing. Before you say discipling is too hard, I want to give you five quick practical pieces of advice. You ready? Yep. Number one, 
pray. There's a revolutionary idea. That's why it's one of our essentials here at Thrive. We say prayer is at the center of everything. If we are not talking to God and also listening for Him, how will we ever know what the heck we're supposed to do? We need to be reading His Word so that we understand His voice, so that when we hear His voice and see that it conforms to His Word, we know that we have been spoken to in some way. Now, I'm not saying that you might actually hear the voice of God. That doesn't happen very often. Even in the Bible, even in biblical (laughs) times, you'll see it doesn't happen very often. But He very often speaks to us in other ways. Very often, it's a relentless pastor who doesn't give you a break and cuts you no slack and keeps asking you when you're going to sign up for group leader training. Because he, for reasons beyond anybody's understanding at that time, has decided that God sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. And I promise you, God sees a whole bunch of things in each of us that we don't see in ourselves And he works in and through others in the body to bring those things out. Being obedient to that sort of thing gives us opportunities to be discipled and to disciple others. And remember, that's a command from Jesus. It's not a suggestion. Pray that God would give you a heart that's receptive and bold. Receptive and and bold, receptive, and bold. Pray that God would lead you to the person or people that you should intentionally grow with in this season of your life. Number two, be intentional. Don't suffer from what is commonly referred to as analysis paralysis, where you think yourself completely into inaction where you completely think yourself and overthink things to a screeching halt. Except the fact that you might mess up along the way. What if you don't get it perfect and Jesus still smiles? I know, that's just crazy talk, isn't it? Pray about it and then Choose a person or two of the same gender and ask them if you could meet on some regular basis to read a piece of God's Word, pray together, and hold each other accountable for what you're reading in life. That's not too hard. Will it require some time? Yeah. (laughs) Might have to give up some TV. You might have to give up something else in your life. You might have to give up Scooby-Doo. <laughs> might have to watch one less movie for the sake of eternity. Just a couple of people. If you if you're if you're if you're that uneasy about it, start with one. Cuz one beats the heck out of none. Amen. Read God's Word, pray together, and hold each other accountable to what you are reading. Number three, be intentional. Now, try to guess how many times I've been asked this week if that's a mistake. (laughs) There's been a bunch. And I I actually put a note in, uh, in when I sent my outline in for the email, and I let them know, this is not an error. (laughs) Number three, be intentional. Sometimes we'll have discipling relationships with people in similar stages of life or with similar life experiences. In fact, in many cases, that's where people want to gravitate to. We want to gravitate to somebody our same age that lives nearby, that we have a lot of common experiences with because it's a little bit more comfortable. And that's all right. I don't have an issue with that. What I am saying is don't only seek out people who are like you. 
The gospel unites radically different people and does so in common purpose. Our discipling relationship should reflect the gospel's power to bring radically different people together. Because it does. If you read God's word, you're going to find out that radically different people came to understand that Jesus was their life saver. That he was the master of their existence and that they were his servants only to discover in that process that he would call them friends. Younger men should pair up with much older men. At least a generation difference. Same thing for women. I won't say older and younger women because, well, you never say older women. <laughs> you just don't do that. You know, that's, that's, that's one of those no-win situations like when somebody asks you, when did you stop beating on her? There's no way to win that one. You will not win that one, nor should you. But women of different generations should pair up. People raised in different cultures should pair up. Seek to enter one another's lives, especially those who are not like you. There's a plan and a purpose in that. That is going to stretch us and grow us in ways that we don't expect, can't imagine. And if God has opened that door is probably something that we need to experience on purpose, for a purpose, because he wastes nothing. Number four, learn one another's story. As you begin a discipling relationship, make sure you know the people around the table. Know their stories. Be a good listener. Be as honest about yourself as wisdom allows. What does that mean? That means it's okay to get to know a person more personally before you start putting everything out there. Let's face it. People are like peeling onions. And that applies to us as well. It's not just other people. It's us too. As you, as you grow in trust, you give up a few layers. That's the only way to get spiritually intimate with another person. It's the only way a discipling relationship will ultimately produce real fruit. It requires speaking the truth in love. But speaking the truth in love requires that two people know each other well enough to be accurate and love each other enough to be genuine. Because now we're talking about real relationships. We're not talking about, hi, how are you? Man, the weather was nice over the weekend. We're way beyond that now. By the way, did I mention that we have an environment for this sort of thing? It's called Thrive Groups. These are our small groups. They meet during the week. And this is a place where you can get your toes in. You can come in and and you don't have to dive in and bear your soul. You can spend a couple of weeks in group just mostly listening and discovering what the dynamic of the group is like and hearing other people's stories. And you're going to hear stuff and you're going to discover things that resonate. That's what happens in groups. And what is said, in group stays in and what is said amen, brother. I'm glad you said that. Also know this. We have, a, we have a standard that we keep in Thrive Groups, and that is what is said in group stays in group. There are only two exceptions to that rule, and that is if a person threatens to harm themselves or threatens to harm someone else. Those, the action has to be taken in those two instances. Everything else is held confidential, and everything else includes everything else. Number five, Live life together. Discipling isn't only about the books we read or the times we pray. It's also about the battles we fight. Anybody fighting a battle right now? 
Everybody is. It might be a big battle. It might be a small battle at this time because we're all in different seasons. But none of us get to walk this journey without discovering some battles along the way. So serve the Lord together. If you're single, fold others into your life. If you're married, fold other couples or singles into your life. Spend time together. Hang out. Did I mention Thrive Groups? Yes, I did. Okay. (laughs) Thrive Groups are small groups of people that meet in homes during the week. Or, Or sometimes here at the church, depending on the size of the group. Uh, but we get together, sometimes they break bread, it's, it varies for different groups, but the, the idea is that there's a lesson that everybody can get, to get on board with, and we get into conversation, and we get into discussion, and we deal with stuff in our <coughs> lives that the lesson brings forth. And if we want to do this, who do we talk to? You want to talk to Pastor Mike. <laughs> Go ahead and stand up for a minute, Pastor Mike, let him see you. He's tall. This guy right here. That's our group's pastor. Now, I've made it as easy as I can for you. If you've been coming here for two weeks or you've been coming here for two years or whatever, now you know who you need to talk to. Now you know that we are talking about just taking a step of faith. It's okay. You will survive this fiery trial. But try a group. When you do, you're going to find opportunities to experience the ups and downs of life. Here's the main idea. Live life together and keep God's word at the center. Don't relegate discipling to a one-hour Zoom call. Instead, follow Jesus in real time as a family. Follow Jesus in real time as a family. There is no substitute for us getting together face-to-face. A man smarter than me once taught that texting contains about 10% of the total communication. 90% is, is lost. Phone call, maybe you're up to 50 or 60%. You can at least hear the person's voice. But when we are in a room together and we're making eye contact, now we're communicating at the 90th percentile. Not only can you hear the voice, you've got the facial expressions, you've got the the body expressions. There's all manner of subtle communication that happens in that that we may not even be consciously thinking about, but it all impacts on how we interact with one another. There's no substitute for us being together. There's no substitute for real-life discipleship. There may be seasons of time in your life when meeting once a week for an hour works best. There may be seasons where the only margin you have is to include someone in the routines of your life. I'm especially thinking about moms with young children when I think about that. The goal isn't that we develop an airtight system. The goal is to love one another as you point each other to God's word and the power of the gospel. The goal, what's next in our lives, should always be becoming more like Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us everything that we require to do what you want done. It's all in your word. It's in, every, it's in every word recorded and every action taken by your Son. All the examples we require are there. You tell the stories of all of the big biblical names that we know. And you tell small stories too. We're ordinary people. People like us have encounters with your chosen people have encounters with your son and lives are changed and it is just as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. Lead us into these relationships, Father. 
as people come to you this week and pray about who should I enter a discipling relationship with? When they start asking you, should I join a Thrive group? I know, Father, that you will give them answers because you answer prayer. We thank you for that. So at the beginning of all of this, keep, help us keep in mind, Father, the first thing we do is come to you and talk to you and listen for you. Then if we think we've heard from you, let's make sure that it conforms to your word. If it does, let's beat analysis paralysis down with a baseball bat and take a step. We thank you for everything that you're about to do, Father. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people together said, Amen. Amen.